What the speak? Episode 17. Check, 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 check it out now. You, you kick ass when you speak, present, or pitch. If not, these expert discussions and insider tips can help you right now, today. Welcome to the What the Speak podcast. I'm your host, Brian Kelly. Um. <laughs> what, 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 what? My guest today is Tom Jackson, a world-renowned live music producer, who is the author of the book Tom Jackson's Live Music Method and the All Roads Lead to the Stage DVD series. Tom is a master at transforming an artist's live show into a magical experience for the audience. He's worked with hundreds of artists, including Taylor Swift and Jars of Clay, and he's a highly in-demand speaker who shares his expertise at music conferences and events around the world. I invited Tom to speak with us about how the things that he teaches his clients apply directly to public speaking. So Tom, it's fantastic to have you here. I really am excited to talk to you today because I think you bring a different perspective that uh, a lot of people who are speaking right now could benefit from because of your experience with stage performers. So thanks for coming on the show today. My pleasure. Looking forward to it. Great. Well, I know that you work with recording artists like Taylor Swift and also bands like Jars of Clay, and you work with them to create unforgettable shows and honestly, to become better communicators from the stage. Um, So I want to talk about some of those specifics with you and also explore a lot of the concepts that you teach your clients um, on ways to engage the audience. All right. Yeah, Yeah, good. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to, to talk about with you is I know that I've heard you say you only get one chance to impress the people who are watching you. Right. So how can those who, maybe people that are just starting off, um, they've had a little bit of experience speaking in front of an audience of people, or we'll say performing in front of an audience of people. How do they do that with confidence and authority? What are some of the things that you recommend your clients? Ah, good. Uh, well, the first thing I have this theory that it, that confidence comes from. It's like a foundational thing. It comes from being prepared. So the more prepared we are, and we're not winging it, not, I'm not against spontaneity, but I'm, not, I'm talking about having a form of what we're going to say to people. Um, the more confident we are is because we're prepared. But then the next thing, which you just mentioned, which is authority. Authority, to me, comes from the inside out. Right. In other words, it's kind of like a, a belief system in okay, wait, this is something I'm supposed to do. This is something I want to do. This is something I I got a passion to do. So I'm supposed to do this. And if we're prepared and we wrestle with that, and it is a wrestling match, no question, because there's always the thoughts, even after 22 years of doing this, I just did a workshop this weekend and I got up on the wrong side of bed one morning and Sure enough, I'm thinking, well, who are you to tell people what to do? And Because that's just a human thing that happens. Here's the good news. That's normal. So the question is, how do we overcome that and walk in that authority? Well, real authority, in my opinion, comes from humility. And real humility is accepting the role. In other words, if you are supposed to be an expert at marketing or teaching this or that, it's you don't want to go halfway. You got to step up to the plate and say, "Wait a minute, this is my gig. I'm bringing it. Uh, no matter what, you know, whether I get thumbs up or thumbs down, uh, because if we just kind of ease into it or play it safe, um, it's not what the people come for. Right. Right. It, yet they come. Uh, I mean, actually, and this applies to what you're saying here. I think. People come to be, for three reasons, they come to be captured and engaged, Mm -hmm. they come to experience moments, and they come to have their lives changed. So the grid that we run our shows through is, are those three things happening? Are we captured and engaging? And all that really means is, are people present? Are they present? Mm -hmm. They're not looking at their watch. They're not looking at their cell phone, texting people, unless they're saying, this is awesome, (laughs) Uh, then then it's okay. Um, but so are we capturing engaged people are we creating moments when we talk and are we changing lives in some way? Are we, are we giving something to somebody where they walk away going, man, that was awesome. I got to buy the book, see that guy again, tell other people about it. 
And uh, to me, that comes from obviously being prepared, but millions of people are prepared. But then with humility, you walk out on stage or wherever you're going to speak and bring it with all, all the wrestling done before you walk out. And then there's another thing that even transcends that, and that's charisma. Right. So we have confidence, authority, and charisma. And charisma to me, uh, for the first 10 years of doing what I do, I, you know, I had labels come up to me or managers or whoever, people who were you know, in charge and say, man, I love what you're doing with the band and the artists, but you know, uh, you can't teach charisma. And for the first 10 years, I was worried about the technical skills like uh, you know, movement, how to rearrange the song, blah, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And then I, about 10 years ago, I started going, no, wait a minute. Let's talk about what charisma is. And to me, I've seen people grow into charisma after they start practicing that authority. Mm. So confidence comes from preparation. Authority comes from the wrestling match within your heart, mind, and soul. And real, just taking the risk that, no, this is my gig. I'm bringing it. And then you walk in that regularly. And out of that, once you're prepared, you start your thing and you, and you find a groove, then spontaneity comes in and charisma. So that's how I teach the artists how to walk in that authority. And they better be prepared. Otherwise, I'll, I'll tell them, go rehearse, yeah. and I'll come back later. Perfect. Yeah. Well, you talked a little bit about creating moments, which I want to get to in a second. But first, I also want to ask you about this other idea that I've heard you talk about where you ask the question of your client or the performer who's going to be on stage to think through the audience and really what the relationship is with the audience. Yeah. You describe it as, are you dating the audience or are you married to the audience? Yeah. Can you explain that and, and kind of what the significance of thinking through that, that particular thought process is? Sure. I'll put this in the sense of a performer. You know, when, um, when uh, a band Perry, a Taylor Swift, a Beyonce walks out on stage and, and says, come on, everybody, stand up and put your hands together with me. 15,000 people jump to their feet and start clapping along. When a performer who no one knows walks out and says, come on, everybody, put your hands together with me. Probably 30% of the people might because they're, they feel sorry for the performer <laughs> or something. In the context of speaking, if we're talking like corporate speaking, you know, it's kind of like if I, who am not a corporate speaker, went out um, and started teaching at all these events, I mean, the, you know, the first time someone saw me, I'm dating them. Mm -hmm. And then following me is, let's say, John Maxwell who sold you know, 30, 40 million books. Everyone knows John Maxwell. Okay. So he's married to his audience. People know his concepts. They're just trying to figure out if they even like me in the first place, let alone what I'm even talking about. Mm -hmm. They're trying to decide in the first two, three, four minutes whether should I listen to this guy with long hair and, you know, I mean, they're really. So dating is just like it is. Dating, you're you walk up to the door, you introduce yourself, you hope the parents like you. You get in the car, she sits on the other side of the 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 thing, and hopefully by the end of the night, she's sitting a little bit closer. Right. Uh, but that that takes a relationship with your audience. Where if you're married, my wife jumps in, sits next to me. Well, I'd like to think that, but <laughs> <laughs> depends on what kind of mood she's in. <laughs> so yeah, it's 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 that's dating and um, married to me. So what are some of the tips that you give those those artists that you're working with that when they walk out in front of an audience, it is that that situation where they're dating. What are some yeah. of the things that you advise them on uh, doing to connect with the audience and, and establish that rapport within that period of time that they're on stage? Sure. Well, you know, with an artist, I have them what I call have a intro moment. In other words, my first, in, if I'm doing an hour show, uh, 40, 50 minute to an hour show, my first six to eight minutes is making sure that they like me by the end of those six to eight minutes. So mm -hmm. I have, um, I have something that is up, a song that is up. I mean, and not too high though. I, I have, a, I have a, this little scale of one to five. And five is rocking song. A one is where you can, it's really quiet here, pin drop. And my whole concept is how do people like to meet people? 
They want to meet him up. Yep. And not too high, because otherwise you'll freak them out or blow them away. Don't want to start too low because it'll be creepy. Um, so I usually start my shows on a scale of one to five, like at about three and a half. Mm-hmm. The lyrical content is to people, meaning I'm actually speaking uh, to people. I'm not speaking about a concept that that's you know that I, I could even close my eyes or show a, a video to or something like that. It's something where I'm connecting visually. My eyes are open. I'm looking at my audience. Yep. Um, I might put pressure on my audience, meaning walk to the edge of the stage a little bit mm-hmm. to connect. It's a song that I, I it really, you know, it's really hard to not like somebody when they're smiling at you. Right. So it's it's usually something that's pretty, you know, I mean, I'm not being a goofy smile thing, but right. I'm just smiling at them. I'm, I'm positive. Um, and I also have little cues in the song so I can listen to my audience to see where they're at. Mm-hmm. In in music, we call it a trash can ending, where you know, and, and everyone listen to this, even if you're a speaker, will know what it is. It's like down at the end of the song, yep. everyone knows to clap. Well, I put something in there not because it's musical, not because, but it's in there because I now can listen to what they're saying to me. That's their way to respond. Yep. So if I have, if I'm a speaker and I and I do speak, um, I have jokes at the top. Not at the very top, but I have in that first six to eight minutes where I'm getting a, a feel for whether they're they're with me yeah. by their response. Because I've spoken, like some of the classes I've done, I've done 300 times, 400 times. That's me. Yeah. And and I, I got the joke. I know what response I expect. If they completely fall all over the place, they, I got them. If yeah. they don't, I know one of two things. They don't like me. Or I'm in Canada, yeah. <laughs> and I, it is because they're a little slower to warm up. Yeah, and so I just I go right for the jungle, and I go, oh, that's right, I'm in Canada, and that cracks them up. <laughs> it's kind of like what Johnny Carson used to do years ago uh, as a front man. He, he would he, a joke would die on purpose yeah. so that he could reply to it, which would get his audience. But the truth is, our job to me is to create freedom in the room. And so I'm just trying to create freedom in the room so that they'll accept what I have to say. And I, I use that first in a, in a, in a rock show or a pop show or whatever, six mm-hmm. to eight minutes to do that. Unless wow. I'm married to my audience. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Tom, that's, that's awesome. I mean, just that, that simple framework that you outlined is probably something that a lot of us who speak in front of a group of people, if we could apply those simple concepts, because really they, they really are simple, but for us yep. to think through and, you know, for lack of a better word, we'll, we'll call it choreograph those particular aspects of getting a better connection with the audience. I mean, that, that's fantastic. So thanks for sharing. I don't like choreograph. What, what's the word you like? I, well, I'm a live music producer. Choreography is dance or... <laughs> Or really kind of goofy stuff at times. Yep. Um, so it's just a little pet peeve of mine. How about we call? Is it more appropriate to call it staged staging? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, and I, I have a plan. Plan. And, and I have a vision for what I'm trying to to do um, with my audience. Mm-hmm. And that vision drives everything. That helps my preparation. That helps. Uh, you know, I, I can see in my mind's eye how the audience is going to respond to certain cues and things. And understand this, that an audience, uh, we are always sending nonverbal signals to an audience. Yep. So the question is, are they intentional or is it random? Exactly. Yeah. Good. Well, let's talk about creating moments. What are some of the ways that you instruct your clients to um you know, build in these opportunities to really, really create something special with that performance that they're giving on stage. Is there any insights that you can share with us? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, the common thought, and I listen, I, I don't know who I'm speaking to in terms of, because there's just like artists, it's such a wide bandwidth here. Yep. But I'll pull from two things. One, working with the artist, and two, for me speaking. Because I, I probably spoke five, six hundred times at music conferences. Yep. In fact, they just did the keynote at the country Canadian Country Music Awards. 
And, and these are the kind of things as I'm looking at my script, the organize, the pre- preparation, I look and I, I'm like, okay, what am I going to keep in? Because I got 30 hours of material. What am I going to keep in? What am I going to leave out? And the temptation always is to cram information. Yep. And, and that's a mistake. Yep. It's just like, um, so here's how I create moments. I'm going to use the analogy of uh, in music, there's a uh, radio song is three and a half minutes long. That's the way it's supposed to be, right in that area. Yep. Um, and when when an artist goes out and plays that three and a half minute song on stage, it doesn't work because it's a different, I mean, it's not that it doesn't work, but it could work way better if we find the moments inside the song. Well, here's my analogy to move this over to, let's say, TV. Um, the Simpsons, which is a show that's been on forever, is a 22-minute sitcom. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the, the people who write that sitcom know they've got 22 minutes. They don't have 28. They don't have, so they know that they've got to work within that framework. Well, a couple of years ago, The Simpsons came out with a movie, A Longer Speech. And and if you would have walked in and seen that 22-minute sitcom back to back to back, you would have felt ripped off. Mm -hmm. So here's what I do with material, whether it's songs, whether it's speaking. I go inside those those songs and find what I call themes, themes that are musical, themes that are visual, things that are themes that are uh, fun, things Mm -hmm. that are... Inside those songs, just like inside whoever I'm speaking to, their their script, there are some themes in there that need to be developed. Right. Instead of trying to cram twelve themes into a twenty two minute speech, or a, instead, let's let's get rid of four of them. I know they're all important, and that's the way I used to feel at the very beginning when I started speaking. Mm-hmm. But instead, I will take less themes and go deeper. Right. And what I mean by deeper is I'll tell stories. I've got this story, and it's so goofy. And I'm, and I'm, talk, I'm talking about stage fright, and I talk about fear and, and this thing that happened to me. And, and um, I tell this goofy story about, uh, are, you know, comes down to, are you likable? That's the question that I've got to answer myself. Yeah. And I go through this whole thing, well, am I likable? Yes. Uh, and I tell the story about flying on Southwest Airlines, and I've got this whole routine where I put my bag up over because the first-class seat on Southwest is an empty seat next to you because there yeah. are no first-class seats on Southwest. Yeah. So it's three and three, and if I get an empty seat and I'm on the aisle, that's first class. So I have this whole routine so I can keep that seat open, right? And I put my bag up, and I do all this thing. I start coughing and hacking, and I have really just so everyone will keep walking by me, right? And that seat will stay open because there's somebody already by the by the window, and I intentionally pick that right. seat. Person's by the window, nothing there. I sit here routine until everyone sits down and then i sit down and go all right you know thank you jesus <laughs> but, uh, but then i tell the story of i thought the door was closed and here comes this guy hey, hey, hey and he sits down next to me and he's so different than me but blah, blah 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 and i tell this goofy story and everyone's laughing and all that um and i'm always tempted to pull that story out mm-hmm. but it is always it always sets it up the whole context for are people likable mm-hmm. and instead of just saying telling uh are people likable yes you are okay move on i tell this whole silly story and i've got bunches bunches i've got i'm a good speaker um <laughs> I've, I've got a lot of stories everyone loves a story mm-hmm. i have a friend who's a who's a pastor and he tells this thing about how this He's got the, he tells all this theological stuff and he goes really in depth on the Trinity and these things. And, the, and he's just a brilliant genius. And then he tells a story later and thing about a strawberry and eating a strawberry and pulled it out of the ground. And, did it. and after the, the, the performance, the speaking thing, most of the people come up and comment about the strawberry, yep. <laughs> not about his deep theology and all that kind of thing. So storytelling, um, around a theme, developing that theme instead of rushing through that theme, instead yeah. of playing a three-and-a-half-minute song or a 22-minute sitcom. So what do you do is I develop themes, 
and I develop characters. And I leave room in my, my show, in my script, when I'm talking, for my personality or for the artist's personality to come out. Yep. Because people come to see people, not just get the information. Exactly. So, yeah. So I develop themes and I leave space intentionally for a place so I can pour my personality into the show. Perfect. Well, Tom, we've got probably just two minutes left, and we could probably talk on and on. You've got so many great nuggets of information, but the last thing I wanted to talk with you about is this concept of communication. Sure. I know you've talked about there's ways that you can do one-on-one communication with the audience, and then what you describe is zone communication. Yeah, can you walk yeah. us through that um, on a final note? Well, I can. To be honest with you, there's bigger, there's there's placement on stage that involves that pressure on the audience. But one-on-one communication is simply, remember years ago, some of the people listening to this probably do, there was a guy put these plates on top of a uh, long, skinny stick, and he'd get one plate going, and then he'd make sure that's going, and he'd get another plate up, and he'd come back to this plate. Well, I break, depending on the size of the venue, I break the audience up into zones. If I'm in a theater... I have nine zones that I break this up to. If there's a balcony, there's three up there and six on the floor. Some venues might only have four or six zones. And I intentionally speak to the, even if I can't see the people on, from the stage because lighting is on me or something, mm-hmm. I speak uh, to those zones. And all, particularly in a big venue, all the people sitting in the back there think I'm looking right at them. Yeah. Because they can't see, they don't know, they can see me, so then that must mean I can see them. And I always start my communication at the back of the room, even on a small room, because everyone everyone sat in the back of the room and tried, okay, I got to stay with you, got to stay with you. When you're in the front, it's easy, right? because they can see everything, there's energy coming right there. So I break this up into zones, and I find one person in each zone that I'm whether it's imaginary or real, I'm talking right at them. I'm playing right to them. I'm communicating with them. At times, I'll point into that area. You know, if I'm playing a rock song, I'm like, yeah, right to that area. And you'll see all these people raise their hand in that area thinking I'm looking right at them. Um, And so my whole theory is if you take an interest in them, they'll take an interest in you. Perfect. And that's it. I love it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of us don't really think about that when – We're standing on the stage, maybe it's at the podium, or we're walking from one part of the stage to the other, that if we can grid everything out that we see before us and start addressing those specific grids, I mean, that makes it so much easier for us to connect with different folks in the audience versus just thinking of it's the sea of, of heads that we can barely see because the lights are projecting on us. So that's a great tip. Thanks, Tom. Well, I want to say one last thing about and this is changing pressure. Yeah. Is this I, when I speak, I use I use a, either a lavalier or a headset because I want my hands free. I don't mind standing behind a podium at first, but I want to break that plane, that pressure, and I'll walk out to the center of the stage. Mm-hmm. In fact, if it's a longer thing, I'll I'll walk. I'll make sure the steps are there, and, I'll, and if I can get light, I'll walk out into the audience and and talk about so some stuff yeah. i want what i want to do is deliver my content from different places on stage um so that i change the pressure on an audience otherwise we have a chinese water torture going on <laughs> right and that's not good unless your speakers are trying to extract information from right. people i don't know <laughs> uh, i love it well cool tom i again thanks so much i think we're probably going to have to have you back another time in the future because again just being able to pick your brain is a, is a huge privilege and opportunity. You've got so many great uh, bits of wisdom. So um, maybe again some other time? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm up for it. All right, great. Thanks again, Tom. My pleasure. All right. Here we go with the outro. Thanks so much for joining us today on What to Speak. Be sure to visit whatthespeak.com for show notes on every episode and to sign up for our email list to stay updated on resources that'll help you kick ass when you speak, present, or pitch. 